All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name's Andrew Jones, and I'm here at Climate Interactive. And uh, you're here for the kickoff of the En-ROADS training. Excuse me a second. Uh, I'm going to launch our first poll here. And uh, you're here a minute early. We're so happy you're here for the kickoff to this training. I'm here with our team of Ellie Johnston and Yasmin Zahar, Caroline Reed, Clara Iglesias, and Janet Tchaikovsky. And we're going to kick this off. We want to find out where you're from. So there's a Poll Everywhere site that we just opened. You can see at the top, it says pollev.com. Maybe someone, uh, uh, Yazzie, if you can post that in chat, uh, there's a site at the top. Open another browser with the name of that site and come in and, oh, here they come. You guys are doing it. Go take this poll. Where are people coming from? Two in Europe, United States, South America, oh, Canada, more Europe, UK. Well, I wish my geography were better. Uh, Japan and Australia, Australia, it is the middle of the night or it's very late. Uh, look at all these people arriving. Okay, if you're just arriving, show us where you are. We see a lot of Europe, some Central America, South America, some Middle East. Fantastic, Australia. Oh, Ellie, Caroline, Yazzie, Jenna, can you believe this? Which ones are you noticing? Your geography is be probably better than mine. Yeah, it looks like we have a lot of people rolling in from Southeast Asia, India. Yeah, we're really happy you guys joined us. We know that the time zones aren't uh, perfect yet, but we're thrilled. We hope you guys are having a, a lovely night and welcome. Yeah, I see us. Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, Spain, Portugal, France, a lot of people coming from the UK. Great to see you all. India, uh, maybe someone there in Nepal or right at the Nepal China border, uh, <laughs> Indonesia, Thailand. Yeah. Great to see you all. South Korea, uh, Japan. Cool. Uh, people coming from Canada. Somebody way up there in the Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> I see that one. Miss Cliff or what? Uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone. Turkey. So if you're just joining us, uh, you are in the right place. If you've come for the kickoff launch for the Mastering En-ROADS training course, we're gonna get going in just a minute. If you're joining us, please go to this site. We're gonna be using these polls some more. Open up another browser, go to pollab.com. You can see the site there at the top. Hopefully you can see it in chat and drop a pin on this first poll. We wanna find out where people are coming from all over the world. Why? Because you believe in your power to make a big difference on climate change using En-ROADS to make a massive difference on climate, and climate related equity. That's why you're here. We're thrilled that the course, this brand new revamped course just dropped this morning. Maybe uh, Yazzie, can you drop the link? If you haven't gone there, if you signed up, you can go in and I don't know, leave now and go watch all the videos. All 40 something videos are ready and exercises, ways to learn how to use En-ROADS to make a big difference out there in the world. But right now we get to welcome people that still the dots are showing up all over the world, folks who are coming today to learn more about this new training program that you can use to cultivate climate leadership. We're gonna get going in just a minute. We're just so happy to see all these people showing up from all over the world. It's three minutes past. We will give one more minute before we jump in, but we just find it so helpful to hear your voices. So many languages behind this. En-ROADS, of course, is in 11 languages right now. We hope it's in yours, but we wanna hear your voice. Could you, we're gonna unmute everybody and please say hello in your favorite language. We're gonna unmute everybody and then we're gonna say hello 
in your favorite language. We'd love to see all your faces. Uh, Hello. Namaste. Hello. 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 You're muted, Andrew. Uh, Drew, yeah, you yeah. you all need to unmute. Okay. So many wonderful voices. So great to see all your faces. I can see the gallery now. So if you're just joining, wow, we have 238 people. This is fantastic. Welcome. Welcome to the kickoff of the Mastering En-ROADS training course. My name is Andrew Jones. You can call me Drew. And I'm here with our team of, well, most of Climate Interactive is here, but particularly running the show here. We have Ellie Johnston and Yasmin Zahar and Clara Iglesias, Caroline Reed, Janet Tchaikovsky running this show to help kick off this time. Why are you here? You're here because you have an ambitious vision for a world that is addressing climate change at a deep level and building climate related equity and justice along the way. And you believe that there's a good chance that this tool of En-ROADS could help you engage new people and make a huge difference by having people choose the policies and actions that are gonna get us on track to where we really wanna go. We have just dropped this full training program. Yazi, if you could put it into chat. If you go there and you signed up, you now have access to all the videos. You can go watch the videos, take the exercises. So the main thing that comes out of this is go take the course. We have the first intro and the workshop. Later, Ellie's gonna explain the other ones. On next week, we drop another whole series. And then the next week, another series. Welcome to this journey. I'm gonna talk a little bit about first about who we are and what we're about. And then Ellie's gonna carry it forward and show you a little bit more about what we've got in the course. And we're also just gonna run the workshop. You're gonna to get to experience a shortened version of the experience we've been taking to top leaders, community groups and others all around the world. So I'm gonna pull up and share some slides, share screen. So I'm gonna share a screen and uh, here is us. So who are we? Hold on a second, let me get to the right. Excuse me a sec. I want to get the right slides. There it is. We got logos. Okay. We are Climate Interactive. We are a 15 person not for profit think tank that grew out of MIT and partners closely with MIT Sloan's sustainability initiative. Um, and along the way, if you do have questions, please just write into chat. And you can ask them right there. We have our team that will answer longer ones. Please go to support.climateinteractive.org and we can share much more, the longer answer with you there. So we are this team of 16 people working closely with MIT. And you probably, if you've heard of our work before, maybe you've run across En-ROADS or analysis, but we're best known for three big things that have brought us to this point. The first is that our simulators made a big difference in the international negotiations pulled together by the United Nations. We had a simulator that in 2008, 2009, and then particularly leading up to the Paris Agreement was used by the Obama administration. It got to the point where John Kerry, who was a Secretary of State, carried the model on his laptop to the Oval Office to show President Obama. He didn't want to give him a PowerPoint, he said. He wanted to actually show him and let him interact with the model. It turns out you can't carry a laptop into the global office, but you get the idea that this is a tool to be used by top decision makers. 
flash forward to the next year in 2014, the Chinese government had our simulator. The US government via John Holdren, the White House science advisor for Obama, and together they used it, John Holdren told us, to structure the bilateral 2014 agreement that helped set up the Paris Agreement. So we had that experience of seeing, wow, these real-time fast-running simulators can help achieve agreement about policies that are needed. So that's one thing, known for the use of the simulators at top levels. The second is that we, in particularly our co-director, Beth Sawin invented the term of multi-solving and really led the work to integrate equity into this conversation with climate. We need to think of those two together. The third way you might know us is that this work with En-ROADS lately, we have found that the US government, particularly the Congress, 36 US senators have experienced the workshop that we're about to run for you in a few minutes. 86 members of the House of Re Representatives here in the US have experienced that same workshop. So you can see with these three areas, we thought we can't do this work ourselves and get the results that we really want. The scale of action that's needed is much greater. So we've been dedicating ourselves to figuring out how can we share this simulator in 11 languages in 80 countries all around the world so that you all, amazing people, inspired, smart, with big hearts and ambitious visions can use these tools to go make a difference. That's what we're launching here is a step-by-step -step training program for you to learn about how to use the simulator to make a big difference in the world. That's why we're here. This is our dream, that you're gonna get meetings you thought you never could get with powerful people at the community level, at the national level, state level, business, NGOs, and academia in your research to make a huge difference using En-ROADS. So that's who we are. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ellie to talk a little bit more about where we're going with this workshop and how people will use it and what you can do with it. Great. Thanks so much, Drew. You can go to the next slide. So we have run this training before. We've, we've been building this network for year, uh, over a year, really focused on inroads. And for our larger network, some of you all may be joining us because you've heard about us many years ago. Um, what we've seen with this is that our trainings have really given people, as Drew just alluded to, this ability to engage decision makers that they couldn't before. You know, you come in with a tool uh, that can give people new insights and they're more receptive to hearing, taking your audience, that kind of thing. Um, this training will also give you the capacity to cultivate climate leadership, giving you the skills to run events, to engage audiences, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with somebody or in a much larger audience, you know, we've run events with hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and then the third thing, uh, that this can give you meaning and purpose and the chance to do excellent work towards your climate goals, whatever they may be. Uh, I've heard again and again from people who are our inroads climate ambassadors that this is a really meaningful part of how um, their contribution to the world uh, is factored in. And that's that's just so cool to hear. You know, I, 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 when I started this, I wouldn't have thought about that, but uh, it really has become a key component. Go to the next slide, Drew. Thanks. Um, so what this whole training entails is it's going to be eight weeks and each week we're going to have a live session like we're participating in now, but the real core of this is going to be videos and quizzes and materials that we have on our online uh, on the website learn.climateinteractive.org. Uh, that's where you all signed up, where you logged in, you'll get an email afterwards that will point you back there. You can go right now and uh, look at look at the materials that we have there. We have released training modules one through three right now. So you can uh, watch videos that give you more introduction to what this training is about, what you can get out of it. Uh, and then also more about the Inroads Climate Workshop, which is where we're starting. The Inroads Climate Workshop is the most popular way that people have for engaging uh, in, with Inroads. But we're also gonna take you through throughout this training into all of the different pieces that you need to know to run excellent events, to engage people. So this entails going through facilitation dynamics, talking a lot about the model dynamics. So uh, in a minute, I'm gonna turn it back to Drew 
and he's going to do an, an inroads workshop and we're going to see inroads in action. Uh, but there's a lot of different really interesting things about the energy and climate system that we can learn uh, with a tool like inroads and we'll be diving a lot deeper into those components. Then we'll be talking too about this uh, concept of multi solving and how we can address multiple challenges. Uh, address climate, address uh, equity challenges, inequality, all of those, these different crises that we face across our world. What are the ways in which we can search for solutions that commonly address all of them? Uh, we'll also be covering advanced facilitation techniques. We realize that you all might be signing up, joining this training, never having led an event before, not being that familiar with a simulator. And we're gonna try and bring you along and build up your skills along the way so that by the end, you feel confident in that. And Drew, go to the next slide. So where this takes us is to what we've already done, which is that uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, 745 facilitators all over the world are already running events. Uh, and maybe some of you even that have joined. I know I see a few names, uh, familiar names in the chat. Uh, it's great to see you all again joining us to continue to deepen and build your skills uh, with this. But through the training, you can become somebody who can facilitate events, add your pin to the map, uh, certainly we have some gaps, we can fill in some blank spots and there's a lot of people out there in the world uh, that we wanna engage. Go, go to the next uh, slide, Drew. Um, so you can see people are running events with inroads in all different kinds of settings from uh, big high level conference halls at uh, economics conferences in Beijing, uh, the, the blue background of the conference there is John Sturman to smaller groups with uh, you know, students and people one-on-one -on -one at their kitchen tables, all different kinds of settings. And uh, there may be settings that we haven't even thought of that you might be able to bring inroads to. Uh, Drew, next slide. And so what this can all culminate in, if you're interested, uh, and I realize people may be coming to this training with different things they're looking to get out of it. But really what we see is the kind of the, 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 the goal, the pinnacle of, of this whole training experience is that you can become an inroads climate ambassador. So this is a real unique opportunity for those who wanna uh, represent inroads events in all different kinds of settings. You can go to our website and find profiles of all of the different inroads climate ambassadors that we have. Currently we have 339. We're hoping what, maybe one day we could have one climate ambassador for every million people in the world. 7,700 uh, inroads climate ambassadors reaching people all over the world. Uh, we still have a long ways to go, uh, but we hope you'll join us in this journey and, uh, and become an Inroads Climate Ambassador. To do that, you'll have to uh, complete the training, watch the videos, do all the exercises, and then most importantly, run uh, some Inroads Climate events. Uh, so to become an ambassador, you have to run at least two events. Um, from here, Drew, I'm gonna switch it back to you. And uh, why don't you take it away uh, with the workshop and give people a sense of what this is all about. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to do about climate and climate related equity, everybody. We're going to talk about this using our simulator En-ROADS. You probably went and played with it a little bit before you got here. You probably saw a little bit at least. Many of you are much more experienced, but of course, this is a simulator that's going to allow you to play out various futures and think about what actions can we take in this real time simulator. Now, of course, here's the setting. So. If we do nothing about climate change, where are we headed? We're headed towards a world that we don't want, where we have a lot more coal. You see this graph on the left goes from 2000 to 2100. That brown area shows us burning much more coal. Now, don't think of just the United States. Many of you are here in the United States where coal is going down. This is China, this is India, this is all over the world where there are a lot of coal reserves. So we have more coal in this future, more oil in red and natural gas. See that growing wedge of green? That is wind and solar, bioenergy and nuclear. If this is where we get our energy, then what we see for greenhouse gas net emissions is the line over on the right. From 2000 to 2100, more pollution. This is the stuff that's collecting around Earth, warming it, increasing temperature. The temperature would be headed at about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, excuse me, Celsius or 6.5 Fahrenheit. So the challenge in front of us, how can we do better? 
the sliders that are possible are down here at the bottom. Yazzie, can you send the one page guide to the control panel? It has an explanation of all the different sliders that are at the bottom. And one note to you all, I'm running a super short version. Usually we spend an hour, an hour and a half running this whole workshop. We just want to give you a little taste of how we tend to use this, obviously online, because that's how we are here today. So what you get to do now is think, what can we do to get that temperature down below two degrees? What shall we explore in order to make that happen? Um, instead of clicking around a lot, I'm just gonna lead us right over and just, I'm curious what's on your minds. So what are, uh, what are the policies that you're thinking about these days. So I'm gonna put up another poll. Please go to the poll that I'm showing right here and um, go to poll everywhere. And what policies would you like to explore? What is on your mind? Oh, here comes some votes. You guys figured this out fast. What's on your mind? Not necessarily what the highest leverage is, but what shall we look at? What are the things, the actions that you think people need to explore and think about as they talk about what we're really going to do. Wow. So it's carbon price, renewable energy, and then a mix of everything else. Wow. Everything is of, of interest. It's great to see. I've never seen such breadth of curiosity. Uh, less coal, carbon price, renewable energy, uh, Wow, renewable energy, carbon price. Okay, boy, the votes are coming in fast. So a lot of interest in, in renewable energy and perhaps setting a carbon price. Um, let's go and just do those two. Why not? All right, so think about, think about, we're gonna do a renewable energy and then we're gonna go with a carbon price. And I'm gonna ask you about some equity considerations along the way. So first with just thinking about renewable energy, what has been amazing is the incredible breakthroughs in renewables that are already forecast to be happening. And this is also gonna give me a chance to show you a little bit of a taste of how we test and build confidence in a model like this. So down here, and I'm clicking on the graphs to show you some of the graphs that we've added. And this is gonna show you a sample of some of the historic graphs and some of the ways that we test a model like this. So this is a graph from 1990 up to 2019. Nothing about the future, just showing you the cost of solar power. So you see this line in purple? That is actual measured data from 1990 to show how incredibly inexpensive solar power has gotten. And you see the yellow line, that is our model going very close to it. So we say, we're pretty close. That helps build our confidence about the model. And then some other interesting data is to show the, the history of the growth. So the yellow line here is our growth of the solar power industry. This is the primary energy demand of wind and solar. The yellow line shows solar growing and growing. The purple line is wind compared against actual data. So it's been growing and we can use this to explore what we anticipate into the future. So I'm going down here and show the amazing growth that we anticipate all around the world in wind and solar already included in this baseline scenario. That is the scenario that you show without any changes. So we're anticipating a lot, but the question is how much more if we subsidize it some more and if we also expand storage for wind and solar. So mind you, we're anticipating a lot. What if we get more? So we like to have you think about that very concretely. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to another poll and ask you to think if we subsidized it more. What do you think the temperature would be after moving the sliders of encouraging more. Now, mind you, we're, we're already, a lot is coming, but what if we encourage more, it, more? Three to 3.3, 3. 3.4 to 3.6, some people are saying. Three to 3.3, 3. boy, 
You guys are good at these polls. And there's, wow, what a breadth. Just note for a second, when you engage people on this, people have very different what we call mental models about what is likely to play out in the future. But boy, there's a consensus. Most, almost half of you think three to 3.3, 3 to 3.3. Keep voting if you like, but I wanna go up there and try it. Okay, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna go back to where we were before and show you all the sources. And so we're gonna do is what we're gonna increase, we're gonna encourage renewables. So watch the green area, watch the green area as we subsidize and I'll look under here to see how much of a subsidy are we gonna do? Well, let's go all the way up three cents a kilowatt hour and three cents a kilowatt hour. Watch the green area expand. Watch the green area expand as we have more wind and solar in the future. We can look underneath the hood a little bit more and see, well, what did that do to the cost of electricity? Here's the marginal cost of electricity production. See that brown line? That's coal in dollars per kilowatt hour. So it's more expensive than the green of wind and solar. And there's blue is natural gas. So what does it cost to make electricity? See that steep curve? That is what we saw before. The, the incredible drop in the cost of wind and solar. So the effect of the subsidy, see the green line going down, it gets even cheaper. I'm gonna encourage it even more by having storage get cheaper and watch the green line go down a little bit more. Now, with that change, we get more wind and solar, but you look over on the top right, it didn't do as much as I thought it would do. Now, several of you, several of you were right, 19% of you guessed 3.4 degrees to 3.6, but most people thought it would be a little bit more. Well, you wanna ask what's going on? Well, one of the things that's going on here, why is it helping? Well, it's helping because we have less coal. Fantastic. The blue line is below the black line, a little bit less coal. However, why are we not getting as much result as you might've thought we would have? It's taking a long time for this new rent renewables to push out coal. As it gets cheaper, we're pushing out coal, but that coal has a long lifetime. The, the power plants live for 35 years. So policies that just push out fossil fuels, by competing with them might be less effective than ones that directly keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Now it helps a good bit. 3.2 degrees is a big help. However, we're obviously going to see it is no silver bullet. We're going to need other actions as well. So let's try other things to try to add. What did you guys vote for? carbon pricing. Let's add a carbon price on top of this and see what else it does. Now, as I add a carbon price though, and you'll see this is how we tend to do it. Make a change, add some other things, put them all together to see, can we get well below two degrees? I want to ask another question. Ask another question, which here is, as we implement a carbon price, what about equity considerations? We don't want to just choose policies that address climate without making sure that we're helping people in the near term, particularly the marginalized, marginalized communities that we're trying to help with climate action. So what do we do with the dividend? There's a possibility of with a carbon price, governments will raise money. What do you do? Oil companies will say it should go to us. Governments should, might say, we want to keep it. People might say it should be given back to folks. Immediate payback to humans would be about a dividend. We need to remember that those will be most impacted did the least to create the problem. Free riders for those with capital to invest in photovoltaics. People say a fair and expected giveaway. This is to like in Australia, distribute money to the citizens, perhaps a regressive tax. What about lo jobs lost? That's part of multi-solving, isn't it? To ask about a just transition. Or cost of electricity subsidized to low, low income consumers. What happens with energy prices? 
Uh, small, rural, and disadvantaged communities can build sustainability. Price of fuel required for daily life. Give it to the global south. What do we do with the extra money? Just workforce transition. The cost of energy increases significantly. The lower portions of the economic structure could bear the burden, exactly. Now, I also wanna ask, what are the co-benefits we wanna make sure to capture? So far, these have been challenges, but I call them equity considerations. What are the co-benefits that we also wanna see? So we, a lot of this has been about cost of energy. These are great answers. And he thinks about what are some other co-benefits? I'm gonna wait until we see somebody start talking about Co-benefits, reinvestment is definitely a co-benefit. What do you do with the revenue? Return it to the citizens, environmental justice. Okay, let's look and see and use the En-ROAD simulator to explore. Oh, there it is, a great connection between the two. Invest more in renewable energy. Okay, so what we've done so far is we have a renewable energy policy. What else? Well, we're going to go back here but also, I'm going to put $100 a ton carbon price. Let's go back here and um, I want to get another estimate. What do you think? What do you think we'll get to? $100 a ton carbon price. $100 a ton carbon price. What do you think the temperature is going to be? Three to 3.3. Yeah, last time it was a little more modest. So I can see why folks are saying maybe it wouldn't be as huge. Uh, three to 3.3 people are voting. This is great. What are you doing? You're simulating your mental models. You're running this model that you have in your head. And in a second, we're gonna run the computer model to see if there's a gap between the two. Most people think three to 3.3, three to 3.3. Okay, you ready? So we're gonna go see what temperature and then also what are the equity considerations and impacts. Okay, $100 a ton. And mind you, you can set any carbon price here in this section, $100 a ton. Get ready, here it comes, 2.9. So this time it had even more of an impact than most of you thought. It was down where a third of you guessed this correctly. Look at that big impact. Watch what happens, why? Look over on the left and see what's going on with global sources of primary energy. Which wedges do you see changing the most? Well, note the world doesn't need renewable energy for the climate. The world needs to keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground. So look at the effectiveness of a carbon price and how soon it helps. Not just how much it helps, but how soon. Here we see greenhouse gas net emissions dropping in the 2020s. Here we see, and I'll run it again, watch that brown area of coal go down and natural gas and the effect on oil. Coal, I'm gonna go down to primary energy demand. Coal dropping very soon. Natural gas dropping very soon. So it's immediate impact, it's not just changing investment in new power plants in the 2030s and 2040s. It is changing the utilization of existing infrastructure. It is not delayed, it is immediate and therefore quite powerful on temperature. Also, why else is it particularly effective? It is pushing up carbon, excuse me, energy prices. And what does that do to energy demand? It is incentivizing energy efficiency and conservation. See in the top left, you can see that final energy consumption, the blue line goes down. People are investing in energy efficiency and conservation. Okay, you can see how it is very effective. And your equity considerations. Well, the big challenge, let's calculate the big challenge. The cost of energy. What do we do? What do we do about the fact that energy prices would go up? Many of you suggested, well, there are opportunities to use that revenue. How much revenue? En-ROADS calculates here with that carbon price, $3.4 trillion a year in revenue that global governments could then reallocate to give to people or wherever they want or to address some of these equity challenges. Now, my, 
I'm giving you some answers here, but as you'll see, when you have a group of people who are actually able to slow this down and talk to each other, we use this to prompt these conversations, to inform these conversations, not to give an answer, but to take a group of people and ask the questions that I'm asking you. How effective is this policy? What are the equity considerations? What shall we think about? This is a challenge with what do we do about energy prices being higher? However, how do we reap the benefits? Like you saw how much less coal there would be. What if we could calculate the future of air pollution. This is PM 2.5 emissions in the top left. Have people think about how to make sure we capture the co-benefits such as the PM 2.5 emissions. This is the soot. This is implicated in asthma and heart disease and lung disease. If we did nothing, it would follow the black line. If we took these two actions together, think of Beijing, think of New Delhi, think of all around the world, the decreased deaths due to air quality if emissions went down this much. This is a much, much better future. Okay, we've made some progress. Now you've seen a little bit about how we got to 2.9 and you've seen a little bit about the uh, interface. So I'm actually going to now kind of allow you to kind of click on the interface in a sense. And um, so what would you like to try next? I'm gonna activate the next poll. And here it's a picture of the interface. So I hope you can see this. Here's the picture of the interface. And what you can do, someone said, oh, let's increase nuclear, energy efficiency, electrification, deforestation, methane and other. This is great, it's working. We've never tried this one before. It's really doing great. Less coal, oil, Bioenergy, increase the carbon price some more, slower economic growth, changes to population, grow more trees, carbon removal, electrification, more energy efficiency. Keep voting. This is fantastic to see. And he, of course, this is the dream, of course. And um, actually, you know what? I just thought I was going to say play with the model. Well, you can play with the model. I'm asking you what it's going to take. I'm going here to the top right corner. I'm copying the scenario link and I'm gonna go down here to chat and send it to you. Why not? We're gonna send everybody right now and you can do this with everybody, with your, uh, everyone in a meeting or to Twitter. So go to chat if you like multitasking and you can open this exact scenario and you can take the actions that you're proposing here in the poll. Share your scenario. And afterwards, go to Twitter or go to social media and say, here is my vision for how we address climate change. Make your own scenario. Put your vision out to the world while you're still voting. Okay, what are we seeing here? I see the most around energy efficiency and afforestation and also agriculture, methane, deforestation, well, all of these actions. I wish we had the full hour I wish we were in person, frankly, but I wish we had the full hour to slow down and run each of these scenarios. Because look at all the curiosity you have. Imagine the curiosity that the people who you're going to be able to get in the room together to talk about what to do. Policy world, government, civil society, business, community groups, whoever. Imagine the curiosity people have about all of these solutions. What I have the time to do today, though, is much more modest because I want to move on to other topics. Um, what's more modest is I'm going to very quickly go through and implement many of the actions that you just took. I wish we could slow down and explain each one because there's so many counterintuitive insights that we haven't shared with you yet. But guess what? They're all in the videos. So the section En-ROAD Simulation Dynamics goes through the top 10 dynamics that answer 90% of the questions that anybody's gonna have about why did the blue line do that? What is going on in the climate system? Also, Ellie shot an amazing video that describes many of the sliders that says, what should I say about afforestation? What should I say about deforestation? What's really going on in the model? So it's all in the training. Go to the learn.climateinteractive.org. 
So to continue the workshop, we've done one policy, didn't do quite as much, there's no silver bullet. We added another one and it got more results than you thought. Let's go try some more. Here's the summary of our favorite graphs. I'm gonna take us back to primary energy demand. Here's where we are. You suggested many other actions. I am just gonna very quickly go through and add many of the things. The top votes I saw, what if we had more energy efficiency in buildings and motors and all of those areas? Watch what this does when we don't need as much energy. 2.7, it goes from 2.9 down to 2.7. It's interesting, wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't need all of that wind and solar, but we addressed it by reducing energy demand. That's what's happening here. That's why the green area is shrinking, energy efficiency. Now watch what happens to oil when we think about transportation energy efficiency, more efficient vehicles and transportation systems. Watch the red line, the red wedge in the top left. More energy efficiency in transport, 2.6. It's not a silver bullet but it is really adding up, we're getting closer. But also all this, you clicked on electrification, if we electrified more, another point one, and in industry and buildings, more electrification, 2.4. I saw a lot of interest, methane and other in agriculture, more vegetarian diets, more wind, excuse me, coal and gas emissions of methane caught, but also landfills, and wastewater, Watch this, actually run this one in your head. 2.4 goes where? Run your mental model, guess where it's gonna go because I bet it's more than you thought. This always surprised me. 0.3 degrees, agriculture in those areas really matter a lot. We're getting to 2.1. Many of you said, what if we grew a lot of trees around the world? That's another 0.1 or so. What if we reduce deforestation? Think Brazil and Indonesia. We are below two degrees, wonderful. If we had some breakthroughs in carbon removal, this is untested, unproven at scale. We don't know if we can do this. Sources of, end of carbon removal right now, what's that green area? Well, we said we were gonna grow more trees. We'd be pulling out four gigatons a year. What if we had more in the areas of ag soil carbon, direct air capture and other areas? There we get another contribution, 0.7, can we get all the way down to 1.5 degrees. Someone said, what if we had different futures in economic growth? What if we had fut different futures of maybe different scenarios around lower economic growth? Um, I'm gonna increase more CDR. 1.6, we're getting so close. I don't even like, maybe if we cut more coal, cut more oil, 1.5, okay. I really just threw those last policies at you very quickly. That's not how we typically use the model, but I really wanna hear more from you about this. <sighs> okay, this is not just about our brains. This is about our heart and our spirit. We wanna slow down for a second and take stock. It is technically possible today to imagine and create a future where we could be on track to limiting warming to well below two degrees. This sort of scenario could be possible. Biogeochemically, the, the global climate system could still limit warming significantly. I'd like you to just be silent for 60 seconds and think about a simple question. In a scenario like this, don't literally look at this scenario. What would you love about being part of a scenario being part of a world on track to making this happen and being part of making that happen. What would you love about being part of a world on track to making this happen? What would you love? I'm gonna make my timer here. And I really am been talking at you a lot. I am merely gonna be silent for 60 seconds. What would you love? Let's just be silent for 60 seconds.
That's a minute. Boy, man, it can last a long time when you're quiet. What would you love? Please write into the poll everywhere. What would you love of being part of a world on track to making this? The next generation. You love the next generation. Well said. The feeling of relief, the loss of the stress, bringing the world together, a purposeful life. Caroline, can you read some of these? They're going so fast. And my, yeah, would you read some as you see them? Sure. Uh, fewer hurricanes, education, equality, contributing to a better planet for all, getting more people engaged and excited, excited about affecting change, the sense of relief that my grandkids will be okay, accountability, being proud and passing it down to my children. A lot of people writing in about hope, hopeful future, more political unity, more resilient communities, an equitable world, not just including the human species, sustained future for our children and grandchildren. Yeah, these are all really wonderful. Thank you all for writing in. Everybody, this is why we're here. This is why this amazing group of people is putting this work out in the world. We want you to create this kind of world in whatever setting you have. We think we have tools that will make it happen a little more effective. We really hope we can help. And it's just so beautiful to see what you are seeing and what you would love. Keep writing them in. We love going back and reading this kind of beautiful words. And creating the space for this kind of work, we hope, that pulls together the brain and the heart. We are whole people leading in the world. We need to embrace this as whole people. Beth saw when you were here, our mentor, Dana Meadows, taught us this. She led the work with the Limits to Growth back in the 70s and the team there in the Club of Rome and had this unique ability to touch hearts and minds. We think we can do this together. So how are you feeling? Ask this question of people, make the space for the good and the bad. Wow, look at all this. Caroline, can you read some more? Yeah, um, hopeful seems to be the, the leading phrase. Um, inspired, so anxious. Um, oh, it's kind of freezing a little bit, there you go. Energized, empowered, important. I think I saw responsibility or responsibility driven, um, interested, rejuvenated, positive uh, communities. It seems like some people are typing <laughs> keywords as well. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So where are you going to make this happen? Where are you going to make this happen? Um, we're so curious to see where you're gonna make it happen. Um, of course, what you're doing is you're down, you're going to learn.climbinginteractive.org. Yazzie, send the link again. The training is there, five minute chunks, 11 minute chunks. It used to be you had to watch a whole hour long webinar on video, terrible. We have chunkified the whole thing. They're in bite-sized chunks. And our team, Clara and Janet, you guys and Ellie and everybody has made these amazing quizzes and exercises. They're not evaluative assessment. They are fun and confirming. They're really kind of cool, the way that we're going to solidify your learning. So go watch the videos and learn how to do this, how to run this kind of workshop, how to create this experience that you're having now, those words that you just wrote to create those kinds of words for other people. So academia, academia and education, about a little over a third almost a quarter business, 15% civil society, 11% government, 8% NGOs. Interesting, interesting. More business than usual on these. This is fascinating. Thank you. So helpful to see what sector you're coming from. So what excites you, not how you're feeling, not what you would love about the world, but when you think of running a workshop, an engagement, sitting down one-on-one -on -one with one person 
or a thousand people. Immersive learning, changing minds, changing minds. <laughs> you want to see results, policy change person. Absolutely. Spreading the word, spreading the word, engage, create a meaningful career. What a career booster to have this tool in your pocket. Collaborative solutions, giving hope, grounded hope to others, getting those who aren't in the environmental sector involved. Caroline, can you read some? I love hearing you your voice on this. Yeah, talking with others about climate change, spreading awareness, teaching youth activists. It's awesome. Changing <laughs> a single mind. Oh, the aha moment, letting them uh, oh, <laughs> letting them trip over their truth. Business or NGOs, dispelling myths. Wonderful. Great. This is so great to see where you're going with it. So another question, very concretely, you're going to take this training. And when you do, who, whom are you going to engage? And I'm talking, you know, you don't need to name names, but you can name names. Very specific. If you can say this group of teachers or this elected officials, we'd love to hear, like, name the area um, Make it specific for you. Whom would you engage? Faith-based groups. Wonderful. Who do you see going to next? If you take the course, you do the exercises, you practice. We have all these opportunities for you to practice. You come to our meetups every Thursday. At this time, we're going to be getting together. Financial institutions, business leaders, city government, senior leadership teams, students. Wonderful local politicians, town staff. Wonderful at the town level. Hey, think global, act local. Play with a global model. Think about what are we doing here in our area? The military, absolutely. Michelle Putko on our team has done a lot with the military. Business leaders, local government. Wonderful, think about those people. And in a minute, you're gonna get hold this information because what we're gonna do is at the end of this, if you'd like to stay late, we're gonna have questions and answers, but you can also meet other people and hear their answers to this and talk to other people about where they're gonna apply this. The students of Duke University, very specific, Republican politicians, ASEAN business leaders, wonderful. Absolutely, university leadership and decision makers, school children, wonderful, okay. We're gonna send it back to you, Ellie, to show a little bit more about the, uh, the course itself, the training and what we have. So I'm gonna send it back to you to show people around in our last few minutes. So great, great. to hear where you're gonna use this. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so in terms of next steps, uh, what we encourage you all to do, you'll get an email from us that will follow up, that'll have links and everything. Go, but go to learn.climateinteractive.org. When you log in, it will look something like this. Uh, you'll see the Mastering Inroads course. This is where you can access all the videos and quizzes and things we've, we've mentioned. And just as a note, what Drew just went through the workshop, he went through it really fast. He pulled out all these cool features like the polls and everything. And you might be sitting there being like, how am I ever going to do that? So the training is gonna break things down. If you if that was too fast, you missed parts of it, that's okay. Just hang tight, come to the, come to the, keep showing up, come to the trainings, you'll learn more. We were just trying to demonstrate what this whole experience can be like. Um, so you can click on the training here. And also uh, note that we're trying to figure out ways that you all can connect with each other. There's this whole community uh, aspect here. Some of you have already found it. We're excited to meet you and interact with you all there. You can click on the community tab up here when you're logged in. Uh, but if you go to the course, um, Mastering Inroads, and then you're on the page and then you click continue, this will take you into the course player. Um, and so in here, you can see the welcome that you all may have already seen. But then now available is modules two and three. So you'll be able to access all of this new content. We have uh, videos um, on all different topics, like the different event formats and that kind of thing. Um, also note, if you uh, like to read rather than watch, you can look at the transcript. 
Uh, we will also be adding um, closed captions in German to some of the videos. So if you speak German, look for those. Uh, you can find that here um, and you can navigate through the some of the videos uh, with the table of contents. And then afterwards, uh, we'll have quizzes and things like that to engage in. So go here. This is where most of the content is. If you miss a live session, maybe you're busy at this time or you're not gonna, you're in Australia and you're not gonna wake up or stay up late every single week to join us. Uh, we understand, just keep showing up over to the online platform. All of these resources will be available to you to go through uh, at whatever time suits you. Um, and uh, one component of this will be along the way, you'll see things like challenges. Um, and so do these, these are ways of practicing your skills um, so the first thing is just to go to inroads, create a scenario, and think about something that uh, is insightful or that surprised you as you were going through. We'll circle back to this and then in the next live sessions. Um, so think about that as a component as well. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it. We really want you to to jump in to uh, the whole learning platform. Remember, this is at learn.climateinteractive.org. Uh, this is the way to connect when we're not here in a Zoom session. Um, and a place where you can find all kinds of information. If you're ever lost, you need you need to figure out you, you're you're not able to log in or you're having trouble with something. You can also contact us at support at climateinteractive.org. Uh, our whole team's available. We'll uh, get your email and and try and help you out. So um, we're we're a resource um, to help support you in getting through this training. And we want you to become an Inroads Climate Ambassador and lead events like this. Uh, so really excited to have you as a part of this. Drew, why don't I turn it back to you and, uh, but also out to you all who are listening. Um, there've been some, a lot of great questions that have come up. Um, so write, go back to poll everywhere, everywhere and uh, write in any questions you have. And I know there's been some questions in the chat, uh, maybe Yazzie or uh, Janet or Caroline, if you've seen any questions. And one thing about those. this, you can um, upvote. If you see a question that was asked that you really like, vote for it and then it will get pushed to the top because there are hundreds of you out there. And so we wanna answer the ones that get the most interest. And where we're gonna be going in a minute, you know, we really are, we like keeping time. So we're gonna stop in four minutes and officially end, but we are gonna stick around. And two things are gonna happen. If you'd like to stay around with us, we are gonna answer more of these questions here but we're also gonna set up breakout rooms where you can go and meet several other randomly pulled together people on this training and see where are you from? What are you doing? Well, you get to meet some people here. Where are you hoping to apply the En-ROADS workshop or the game, et cetera? So if you'd like to stick around and meet people, stay with us. If you wanna hear some more answers to questions, please stay with us. But Yezzy and Ellie, any questions that came up in chat or something that, boy, just didn't get said before we looked to these questions that are being typed here? Well, uh, I do see the top question, uh, which also has been coming up in the chat as well as people just curious what the time commitment is like uh, for this training. So the way, what we're estimating right now is about one to three hours each week. So there's this live session. This is an hour. You're welcome to stay later and connect with other people, but uh, if you want to, if you want to leave here at the top of the hour, that's okay. Um, and then the videos and the quizzes going through those will take another hour or so. Um, some weeks it'll be shorter, some weeks it'll, it'll be longer. And then beyond that, it's as deep as you want to go. You may want to pr be practicing and playing with things. You may just not have the time and may want to, uh, go through things, uh, at your own speed at whatever time frame works for you. But generally think of it as like one to three hours with uh, the scheduled session happening every week at this time, and then the videos being available and quizzes for you to go through uh, outside of uh, the live session. Great. How is the IPCC people involved in the simulator and how, is, oh, great question. So this is about how do we build confidence in a model like this? How do we do that? And so there is a whole training. One of the six sections is just on this topic. So the short answer is wait till week five, Ellie or so, or six, and you can watch 
that whole training. But I'm gonna give you the short answer is that we built the model with MIT using the best available science. And when the IPCC publishes their scenarios of the future, one way we build confidence is that we compare all of our scenarios against those of what are called the integrated assessment models under a baseline scenario, but also what they call the reduction scenario. And we publish all of those results of how our model reacts to the same inputs that theirs did. So that's a really helpful way for us to build confidence in the model. Also, all of the assumptions, all of the equations are shared in our 400 page reference guide. Yazzie, can you post that in chat, the link to the reference guide that's out there? And if people don't like assumptions, or they see the world differently, many of those assumptions can be changed here in the model. I didn't show you this before, but you go here to this section and you can change many of the assumptions. You see, where did the assumption say for the climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon, for example, be? And you can change and see that, wow, if it's lower, we get all the way to 1.3 degrees in that scenario or higher. It shows the reference, the IPCC 2014 report. So that's another way. And also we have written a paper that we're going to be putting out into the world for peer review. So we play this like just normal scientists, share our result with our peers in order to get the kind of criticism that builds our confidence that we're doing this well enough to empower you all to use it with the kind of confidence you need. How often do you update the assumptions of the data? We have a release pretty much every month. Sometimes we skip a month. But every month there's a new release and you can go here to the model and click up here to release notes. So you go to this part and you can read and would someone send the link to this? Yazzie, could you send the, the link to the Virgin History? June 21, you can see we added the clean electricity standard and social cost of carbon. And sometimes this is a new features. Sometimes it's updates that are related as you wrote to science. What's new in the world? that needs to get included. Um, I am noting it is 1201. And we said we were gonna give you the chance to, if you wanna answer questions, stay here. If you wanna hear the answers to questions, stay here. If you would like to go meet other people, um, we're gonna give you that chance right now. So take it away somebody to set up the breakout rooms if people wanna go and have a visit. And I would say anyone on CI who's curious, join the breakout rooms, we're always, good to have people see what's going on. But then I'm going to answer some more questions or the team is going to answer questions. Ellie, would you like to describe how this, oh, there you go. Can you describe so, what should happen now? So the way this works is that you've been assigned to a breakout room. You can go to it and you're welcome to join it. If you've got to go, you can go can get on with the rest of your day. These are informal. They're just a way for people to connect. If you want to stay in the main room and keep asking questions and listen to Drew uh, respond to them, you can just say, not now. You don't want to join the breakout room and you can just stay put here. But the breakout rooms, they're just designed uh, as ways for people to connect. You all can chat amongst yourselves. If it's not useful for you, then leave. You know, we're, We can all make our own choices about where, where yeah. the best use of our time is. So. Um, Definitely. Also, I'll make a note. Uh, I'm loving what I'm seeing happening over in the chat. Uh, you all, a bunch of educators uh, thinking about how to form a subgroup. Um, so we'll definitely uh, keep an eye on that and maybe we can help facilitate that in some way. I know that the, the learning platform does support groups. So maybe there's a way we can create a subgroup of, of educators so that people can connect and share resources and best practices there. Uh, love to see that. Uh, that's excellent and uh, continue to feel free to facilitate whatever whatever you'd like there. Um, but yeah, take it away, Drew, with some more questions. And um, yeah, join a breakout room Great. if you're interested. Great. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna go back to these questions and uh, are there estimates about costs associated with the different policy options? In En-ROADS, the answer is no. We found, we tried, we surveyed the literature and we did not have enough confidence in what all of the costs are to add it to the model. So you can imagine what would it cost to have the energy efficiency improvement rate go up 1%. It was 
Two, there wasn't enough supporting literature to do that and not just energy efficiency, but imagine in all 18 of those levers. We do have a project with a team at MIT to add carbon price costs and some of that, but uh, effects on the economy. We don't have that yet. If fossil fuels are not used, will their supply, surplus supply, not reduce their prices and restore their demand? Great point. This is an important feedback loop. Imagine there's more supply <laughs> that's out there. Won't that have a feedback process and boost demand? Yes, that is explicitly modeled. And in the scenarios you saw, that is happening. The key is that it doesn't completely restore the demand, it partially restores the demand. And that's one reason why uh, taxing coal doesn't have the huge effect that you would hope because of this feedback loop. Great point, it's in there. How would reduced consumption of goods support climate goals? So there's different ways to look at that. In En-ROADS, the best shot we have would be, well, if you're playing with this scenario, to really think about some of these scenarios where we imagine people meeting their economic needs without expanding the size of the economy. And we could imagine that by imagining different GDP futures. Look at gross world product. What if in the long term or the near term, people meet their needs without continually expanding consumption? Slower growth therefore less energy use, therefore less emissions. And it could be even more if you want to explore other possible futures. That's one way we capture it. But this is not a model about explicit material consumption. There are other really good analysis on that. Um, I think we've answered this one about how we know it's accurate and go check that out. I'd like to see other consequences besides temperature. Absolutely, holistic consequences. So do we. This is one of the things that we're working the hardest on. Yazzie did some research on it. Adem on our team did some research on it. And so what we're adding right now and what's coming out over the next year, particularly if we can find more resources, will be more impacts that are out there. If you go in the model, you can see some of them, sea level rise, what happens to sea level rise? What happens to the oceans? We'll go down here to impacts, ocean acidification. We've been collecting data for the population that would have to be displaced if there was sea level rise inundation. We've been collecting data on the change in the habitat for various species, vertebrates, invertebrates, et cetera. That's some of the data. We have some data that we're gonna be adding in graphs here in the future to the change in crop yield, corn, maize, wheat, and others. Uh, the number of days or the, the likelihood of there being no polar ice cap. We are working hard on our modeling team to add many of those features because they matter so much. I want holistic measures too, well said. Uh, how can good international and national policies be, be enacted given political obstacles? Great question, yes, for later in the course. Have we thought about connecting En-ROADS to healthcare problems around? So Dr. Beth Sawan on our call and our, our co-director has really led our work of trying to connect as many of the dots there. You saw before that we're looking at air quality we tried to add explicit healthcare costs from air quality, but couldn't find enough data to support connecting global PM 2.5 to global health. So we include that in the conversation around the simulator and in our workshops on multi-solving. I'm curious why there's so little happening when it comes to sea roads. Good question. So sea roads is our other international model and people are running the world climate game a lot. Here's sea roads. It is important. It is about the emissions of the US and the EU and India and China. And it is excellent and helpful. Why there is less happening there, we think, and this is a strategic choice by Climate Interactive of what to develop, is that the conversation through 2015, 2016 in the Paris Agreement had been a lot about what are the pledges to the United Nations that are gonna be made? What 
our folks, countries saying about what they're going to do with emissions. But we think, and we started investing in 2015 more heavily in helping the conversation about how to reduce emissions. Not what countries' pledges are, but how. And that's what led us to this framing that we really like right here, which is much more about, as you can see, coal, oil, gas, energy efficiency, agriculture, carbon removal, carbon pricing, population, economic growth, electrification, that whole world of policies. So we've been investing there because we're a small team, we have to take our shots. That said, many of you have run the world climate game. I run the world climate game and it is a great way to engage people. Also, there are now about 20 teams, think of the emissions gap report and others that are doing the same analysis at Sea Roads. In 2008, we were the one of two teams, us and Peak were the two people on earth doing this analysis. Now there are about 20 different groups. So that's one reason that we're shifting to what we think is the cutting edge. Okay. Uh, Actually, Ellie, do you want to look at one that, that you like? And maybe we'll pass it back and forth a bit. Um, were there any questions that are coming up that you think would be good to answer? Um, let's see here. I didn't have one in mind. Um, sorry, Drew. It's all right. I put you on the spot. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, I do see a, a message. Uh, I, some, some people have gone to breakout rooms and nobody else showed up because everyone is hanging out in the main room or whatever. Uh, uh, Yasmin says that you should be able to self-select into another room or just let us know in the chat and we can move you to another one. I see that some breakout rooms have a few people in them. Uh, others don't, um, uh, we can, you can move around. Um, or, you know, if I, I also see some people are having to log off. Uh, I'm actually, yeah. Things today, so. That's, okay. That's I see okay some good well. questions too. Is it possible to extract data sets? Oh, yes, absolutely. So you make a scenario that you like. I don't like looking at 3.6 degree futures. Um, so there's one, 2.5 at least. It's about, hey, what is the greenhouse gas net emissions here? can open up Excel. So you analysts who are out there, people who are on a tool to use it for, then I'm gonna paste it in there and the data is all yours. Go get it, go use it. Great question. Um, students will ask how to make these changes happen on a global level. So far, not happening fast enough. What can students actually do? So that is the last section of every workshop. What do you want to think about? What is high leverage? What is not high leverage? What is, the, what is possible? Seeing that it's possible. 60 seconds of science, future, how are you feeling? Then what are you going to do? And so that is a facilitator. World? Are they part of a business or impact? Can they join a civil society group? Can they pull together and create power with other people to make a big difference? Students arguably have made the biggest push. You think of Fridays for the Future and Extinction Rebellion and Sunrise Movement and 350.org. It's amazing what's been happening with student leadership and the ability of them to pull together, find power, deliver power and get results. So help set people up, challenge with them, give them some ideas, and then they can go take whatever action feels most appropriate. We are looking, theory is good, but how do we get building efficient for everybody in the world? Seems not practical. We need realistic solutions and proposals. Absolutely. Think global with a tool like this. Act local. So this kind of work with En-ROADS needs to be complemented by realistic solutions and proposals, as you say. There are groups that are thinking about how to take action, say, in energy efficiency. Very practical. I think of like ICLE, the local community group. 
and others that give practical guidance in different specific sectors of your economy of what can be done. Absolutely, you have to couple this with practical, efficient uh, work. Without coal, would the economy of India collapse, creating mass migration of 100 million people? Wow, I am with you. How do we think well about these important questions of just transition? How do we think about meeting multiple goals, preserving healthy economies, addressing climate change, preserving jobs? How do we have that conversation together? Our suggestion is that there's no easy answer. It happens in conversation, not just people talking around a flip chart, but hopefully grounded by actual data. That's what we hope En-ROADS will help you think about. Great question. Is there a chance I can have an offline copy of the materials that I can read on my phone while I'm on the road? Yes. So all the materials that you see here are on the Climate Interactive page. So you go here to Tools. You go here to Workshop. And on this page, if you scroll down, workshop materials. So all of the materials are here, including the facilitator guide, which is we wrote, which just explains how to run the workshop. It's all written out. So go read it there. Absolutely. The other, the other thing I will add to that too, is that um, you can access the training platform learn.climateinteractive.org on your phone. Uh, it, it will, you can watch videos and read through the transcripts uh, that way too. Great. Are screenshots, materials, and resources free to use in education materials? Yes, we put a free to use, free to share license on it. I know Ellie, you were closer to that, but the short answer is yes, you can use everything for education use, for business use. If you're a consultant, you can take our materials, go out there and use it to make money. Free to use, go make a big difference in the world. Yeah, huh? and uh, uh, the materials, they're under a Creative Commons license. That's it, thank uh, you. So give us, you know, we ask that you give us credit for it, you know, don't pass it off as your own, but um, you're welcome to adapt them. Uh, many previous facilitators have taken our materials uh, edited them to the specific audience that they're working with. You know, I have seen middle school teachers who have, you know, pulled out different keywords, made a glossary and edited things to make them more simplified in other contexts. Uh, uh, we were just in touch with some ambassadors in Russia who were looking at uh, reconfiguring the materials and moving the way Russia was represented around all different kinds of things. So do what makes sense for you. Our, our whole aim here is that you can we provide you something that you can make a difference with. So we are all in this global uh, action together of addressing climate. Well said. Where is the community online for this? Ellie, you wanna talk about that? Yeah, so again, uh, if you go to learn.climateinteractive.org, once you're logged in, click on the tab that says community and you'll see there's a discussion board there. Um, we're, we're figuring out all the features for it, but I think there's even a groups function. So. Uh, we may be able to create some groups so that people can kind of have study partners if they want, or you can kind of invite others from your region, whatever it may look like. But the, the online community at learn.climateinteractive.org, that's also where you find the videos and everything. Uh, engage in the discussions there. Are we going to learn about the composition of the model itself? Yes, that is, I think, the lesson module six or so. I was talking about it before. This is coupled with testing of the model. So there's a whole technical training, which is what is the model? How is it built? What are the sectors of it? Then how do we test the model? There's a series of five main tests that we do. So that will be a training that you'll get in, I think week five or so. There are five different bills in the US right now, two in the Senate, three in the House. They have Carmen Price increase X percent over consumer price index. Will you model this? And that's related to this question I saw as well about country level models. 
uh, like, can you adapt the global model to emissions of one country? The short answer to that second question is no, this is a global model. So when you wanna think about a carbon price and the carbon price bill in the US, you need to take the systems level insights from a global model and then think about how they may apply in the US. You should use a different model to think about the US. We encourage you to go look at energy innovation, energy innovation. They have a US model where they're modeling the bills and carbon price. And many other countries have national models. That is not En-ROADS. Wow. Uh, I think I should take one more, but uh, I think we should end. Wow. Okay, there are more questions. At this point, the place to go with questions would be here. Go to support on our page, support.climateinteractive.org. And here, when you have more questions, go to our knowledge base, go to our FAQs. There are hundreds of articles here about answering your questions. Um, and if there, it's not answered below, you can type in here. I want to know a question about renewables. You get to see all the different questions, but also you can ask your own question there. Okay, everybody, we're going to close this kickoff. We're so thrilled you showed up. We're so thrilled that you stayed around for all the questions and answers. Just want to call out again to this amazing team of Ellie and Yasmin and Janet and Caroline and Clara, you all are amazing. You all made this happen. Hope you can go watch the videos, do the exercises, go out there and make a big difference with the simulator. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Great, thanks. And uh, we're closing the breakout rooms too. So uh, people will be coming out of those breakout rooms in just a few seconds and we can say goodbye to all of them <laughs> coming from the breakout rooms. Thanks everyone. All right, welcome back. If you were just off in the breakout rooms, uh, hope you had a good conversation. Maybe you met some new people. Uh, we're wrapping it up here. Uh, so just wanted to say thanks and uh, we'll see you next week. And um, in the meantime, check out learn.climateinteractive.org where all the videos and resources will be. Um, but uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.